Family Physicians Association of India Thank on you. behalf of the President and the Secretary, Dr. Pragnesh Shah and Dr. Pragnesh Vacharajani and the whole team here. I welcome you all. I welcome Dr. Tushar Shah for one more lecture from him on vitamin supplementations. And without you all, we will not be complete and we will not have this program. Thank you all the attendees who joined on YouTube. Thank you very much. And I welcome you all. Wish you all a very nice Navratri and a very joyful Navratri. Before we go into Navratri, let us hear here from none other than Dr. Tusharsha. We are, he doesn't need any introduction. He is an uh, academician and a physician from Mumbai, for advanced specialty hospital. He's attached to that hospital. But we all know what a passionate teacher he is. And over to Dr. Tushar Shah for today. Uh, scientific use of vitamin and mineral supplementation. Over to Dr. Tushar. Thank you so much, Dr. Preeti. And uh, thank you all for joining. Today's, art, uh, today's topic is a commonplace topic. More, many of you have heard me before, probably on this topic in other lectures. But uh, uh, once more, is always a good revision for me and all of you. So uh, we'll start with... Dr. Tushar, one minute. Dr. Yeah. Tushar, one minute. All the attendees who have joined today, I request you all to keep a piece of pen and paper because Dr. Tushar is not going to have a PPT today, but he is going to give us a lot of interesting pointers which you will have to note down. So kindly be ready with your pen and papers. Yeah. Uh, so again, though it is only vitamins, I'll also be doing calcium and iron if, uh, if I get time. So I will start with iron therapy. And uh, iron therapy... I'll, of course, most of you know most of the things about iron, but there are some areas where uh, we may have to unlearn and uh, do some new learnings about iron replacement therapy. I'm not going into details of diagnosis of iron deficiency, deficiency anemia. Suffice it to say that uh, if a patient comes with microcytic anemia, that is low hemoglobin and a low MCV, the MCV being be be below 80, then you have to start thinking of iron deficiency. And when the microcytic anemia is present, the two commonest causes, of course, are iron deficiency and beta thalassemia trait. And the differentiation between these two is fairly simple, where the uh, RBC count is low in iron deficiency and high in beta thal trait. The RDW, red cell distribution width, is high in uh, uh, iron deficiency and normal in thalassemia minor. So we know the differences between these two, even, uh, even after not uh, uh, being able to to segregate only on the basis of CBC. If we want to know more, we can do a serum iron study uh, or a beta thaltrate related hemoglobin electrophoresis. In a serum iron study, typically we order for either only serum ferritin or only serum iron studies with TSAT. TSAT means transfer in saturation. Uh, ferritin, remember, remains the most specific test for iron deficiency, uh, deficiency anemia, meaning if the ferritin is low, there is no differential diagnosis and it is IDA. But sometimes the ferritin is not low, especially in acute infections. So that becomes a false negative test where the ferritin is high, even in a patient with iron deficiency. Now, serum iron studies with transferrin saturation becomes a very sensitive test. It is not as specific. But, uh, but a very uh, sensitive test where a low TSAT below 15% transferrin saturation becomes a diagnostic feature of iron deficiency. And of course, thalassemia can be diagnosed by doing a hemoglobin electrophoresis, which will show a hemoglobin A2 more than 3.5%. So once you've diagnosed iron deficiency, now what is the next step? You have to correct the cause and you have to correct the anemia. The commonest causes uh, uh, in adult medicine remain menstrual losses, uh, NSAID therapy, and GI malignancies. So you must keep a watch out for the red flags of GI malignancies. Uh, ask for occult blood in urine, uh, uh, sorry, in stool, malina, and uh, investigate accordingly. I will not go into investigations, but we will straight away now go to therapy. Once you've treated the cause, how do you? How do you also correct the hemoglobin? The one thing that I do empirically in almost every patient of iron deficiency anemia is that I give an empiric deworming therapy, uh, which means you will give albendazole. And typically, I would give two doses of albendazole, 
one dose today and one dose after two weeks of the first dose. So this is what, this is what I would empirically do. Um, then the next step is, of course, correcting the iron. We have two modalities of giving iron. One is oral iron. The other is parenteral iron. Oral iron is the preferred modality of, uh, mode of uh, treatment. And the relearning or uh, new learning that we have to do in oral iron therapy is that we have to keep the dose low. Meaning we give, instead of giving 100 milligrams of brands like Otrin, Oro for XT, we give 50 or 25 milligrams of elemental iron per day. Avoid 100 milligrams of element, Witco fall capsules, all these are 100 milligrams. 100 milligrams are not only tolerated poorly, they also are not absorbed fully and therefore they give, cause more GI side effects. So go low on the dose of iron, daily dose of iron. So typically what I use is a 25 milligram elemental iron preparation called Rary Cap, for example, or a 50 milligram preparation called FIFOL or FIFOL Z, Z or Fesovit, for example. These are 25 and 50 milligram and they're better tolerated. So your compliance becomes much, much more. Also, you must, you one more thing that you can do is if you want to give a 50 milligram preparation, try to give it alternate day, like FIFOL or FIFOL Z or FESOVIT, give it alternate day rather than daily. What happens with alternate day therapy is that the patient's uh, absorption improves. For example, today's oral iron will uh, reduce the absorption of tomorrow's oral tablet. So to prevent that, you give a break and then give it on the alternate day. So 25 milligram OD or 50 milligram elemental iron alternate day works very well. You can... Uh, this also makes the patient's constipation or diarrhea, which both can occur with iron, uh, a little lesser. Uh, so that is what you can do with oral iron. How long do you give oral iron? Suppose the patient started, a female patient, whose target hemoglobin is 12 grams per cent. The patient started with 9 grams per cent. The first thing you do is check the hemoglobin after a couple of weeks. Two weeks is the correct time. If the hemoglobin rises by one gram per cent, that means you are on track, the patient is not actively bleeding and your iron is working. After the hemoglobin starts rising, then you reach the target hemoglobin. In females would be 12, in males would be 13 target. Reach the target hemoglobin and continue the oral iron for two to six months beyond the normalization of Hemoglobin. Why two to six months? To build up the stores of iron that every patient must have. So the uh, two months or six months, you can decide based on the patient's tolerance, etc. So that is the complete course of your iron therapy. Now, if you, what are the indications of giving IV intravenous? Now, you know that we don't give intramuscular iron anymore. We should not give at least. So what are the indications of intravenous iron? The most important indication of giving intravenous iron, the most common at least, is intolerance to oral iron, meaning patient has GI symptoms and just can't tolerate even 25 milligram dose. Now is the time to give parenteral or intravenous iron to, uh, to the patient. Intravenous iron is also given to patients who have a poor compliance rate. For example, several elderly patients, they don't remember to take the medicine. They don't want to take the medicine for, uh, for personal reasons. In these patients, giving an IV iron uh, works much better. Than you, are, you are ensuring a dose. The third situation of uh, intravenous iron is when there is malabsorption. Some patients who had bariatric surgery, some patients who had celiac sprue-like illness or ulcerative colitis, they if they cannot absorb the iron well, you will have deficiency again. So again, these patients, parental iron might be required. Then there are two disease states, the two chronic disease states where IV iron is sometimes given. One is congestive heart failure. We have now evidence that in congestive heart failure, intravenous iron, uh, relieves the symptoms of patients significantly. And the other chronic condition is CKD. Often in CKD, intravenous iron is used. So these are the conditions where intravenous iron may be used. If you do decide to give intravenous iron, there is a complex formula that uh, you can use. What I would do is just this. Give 15 mg per kg per dose maximum. Suppose a patient is 50 kg. So give 750 milligrams of iron intravenous. 750 milligrams are not available as a standalone uh, 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 dose. So you can give 500 milligrams and give say, 250, uh, 500 later, make it 1000. But 15 mg per kg is the maximum dose at one go that you can give. Diluted in 100 ml of normal saline, 
and give intravenous. Uh, intravenous dose can be given as quickly as 15 minutes. Now, can you give it in your outpatient department, in OPD? I would say the first dose definitely do not give in the OPD. Give the first dose in a hospital because anaphylaxis, though very rare, can occur and therefore you should take precaution. The second dose onwards, you may want to give in the uh, in the OPD. Uh, how much is the total dose of iron required? There's a formula for that. I'll not go into the formula. But what I usually do is I reach the target of uh, hemoglobin by checking the hemoglobin two weeks after my two, 15 mg per kg dose. And then I will give one more dose if I don't reach the target and check again after two weeks. After I've reached the target of my hemoglobin, I will give one more dose for storage. That one more dose of storage will be not 15 mg per kg, but 10 mg per kg is my, there is no set formula, except there is one uh, mathematical formula given for iron, which, which I don't use, but that can be used. Uh, so there is a parent line. Now, which parental preparation will you prefer? There is iron. There are three preparations that is that are commonly available: iron sucrose, iron, uh, ferric carboxy maltose, and iso uh, iso maltose. Is it iso? I'm forgetting forgetting the name. Forgetting the third name, which is a relatively newer uh, molecule called iso maltose, I think. And this iso maltose is supposed to be a little better than the common one that we use, which is FCM very carboxy maltose because it causes lesser of one side effect. That side effect is of hypophosphatemia. So isomaltose is like being preferred by many over the FCM. But this I have not yet used ever. Uh, so that is uh, the parental ion therapy. What are the side effects you should, you should look out for? The side effect mainly is darkening of skin. When you give the IV, the limb in which you are giving it IV, even a small amount of extra will make the whole area black. Uh, that is cosmetically a problem. Some patients, rarely some patients get darkening of the whole skin all over the body, which is a distressing, very distressing symptom. And this I have seen in two patients at least. And that is something that you should, that should make you think twice before you give parental line, especially to a young person who's cosmetically very, very aware. And uh, if you uh, if you can avoid IV iron in young patients, that'll be nice. Remember that intravenous iron does not hasten the rise in hemoglobin to a great extent. So if a patient is getting you know married and you you want the hemoglobin to be better than nine grams that the patient has, intravenous iron will not make it faster. Give oral iron within two weeks, you will see a rise in hemoglobin, and you will continue to see the rise in hemoglobin. So the bone marrow can only do so much with iron. It cannot make it very speedy, the recovery of hemoglobin. So that is about <clears throat> iron therapy. Uh, the, another side effect is the hypophosphatemia. Now, this is one side effect that I have never bothered about much, except now literature on hypophosphatemia has been increasing. So it is probably a common side effect of uh, intravenous iron, including FCM, FCM more than isomaltose. Now, if there is uh, hypophosphatemia occurring, this will cause weakness. Main symptom of hypophosphatemia is muscle weakness. And therefore, we will be confused about whether the symptom is due to the anemia baseline or due to the uh, hypophosphatemia. You will just have to check the phosphorus, serum phosphorus, and correct it. So uh, that is one problem. The, uh, yeah, so that is the, that's all about the side effect. Now let's go to B12 deficiency. This was about iron deficiency. I'll of course take questions when you when we do the discussion. Now B12 deficiency also has some areas of rectification from our side. We should rectify our prescriptions a bit. There are several brands which should go in the dustbin. Now, first of all, what will happen to the CBC in B12 deficiency? We will see macrocytic anemia. Hemoglobin will be low. MCV will be MCV will be high. Normal MCV, I'll repeat, is 80 to 100. Above 100 MCV, you will have macrocytic uh, anemia. There are three or four common causes of macrocytosis. The most common is B12 deficiency. Uh, folate deficiency is less common. Then alcohol by itself can cause macrocytosis. Uh, alcoholic cirrhosis will show macrocytosis. Hypothyroidism can have macrocytosis. So there are some commoner causes of macrocytosis or high MCV. B12 deficiency will be easily diagnosed if you have, say, a hemoglobin of 8 and an MCV of 110. 
there is no differential. This is probably B12, not folate because folate deficiency is uncommon. B12 is so common because of vegetarianism. Vegetarian diet, except milk products, probably have very little B12. So B12 deficiency is extremely common in vegetarianism. Veganism, even more, more so because vegans don't take milk products also. Now, if there is a, a B12 deficiency in a person, there can be two principal causes of this deficiency. One is, of course, nutritional deficiency. Intake is poor, like in veg vegetarians, or malabsorption of B12. Malabsorption of B12 occurs in some diseases. The commonest malabsorption problem is called pernicious anemia. Pernicious anemia is deficiency of intrinsic factor. Intrinsic factor is required for absorption of B12 in the gut. Some patients have an autoimmune disorder called pernicious anemia where the parietal cells do not produce intrinsic factor in the stomach and therefore absorption does not occur. Uh, now, one physiological thing that is very important in this and therefore our treatment should change dramatically is not all B12 taken by tablet or food is absorbed using the intrinsic factor. 1% of orally consumed B12 is absorbed irrespective of the presence or absence of intrinsic factor. Meaning, if you, if you give a patient 1000 micrograms of B12 orally, 10 micrograms will be absorbed even if there is no intrinsic factor. Now, this is very important because uh, we give very high doses unnecessary. So, now how does this work? If the patient has pernicious anemia, uh, per, patient cannot absorb anything. What we often used to do is give injectable B12. You know, injectable, you know, Vitcofol C is an injectable, for example. What does Vitcofol C contain? It contains 2,500 micrograms of B12 in the pink colored ampule. And, and 2,500 microgram is a high dose of B12. If we give 1,000 microgram of injectable, like 2 cc of plain Vitco fall injection, that gives 1,000 and 10% will be, uh, sorry, 1% will be absorbed. So 10 micrograms will be absorbed in the, I'm so sorry, I'm a little con I'm confusing you. I'm so sorry, I'm talking about injectables. Sorry, I'll let me talk about orals. I'm very sorry. Oral, when you consume, 1% is absorbed irrespective of the this. Now you have my tablets like Methicobal, Folinex, Tomocheck, Hosit very high dose of B12. A normal vegetarian person requires only 15 micrograms consumed orally every day. So if you give Hosit, for example, Hosit has 1,500 micrograms of B12. Folly next, 750 micrograms of B12. Homocheck, 400 micrograms of B12. These tablets are high dose B12 tablets, not required for vegetarians. Vegetarians, how much do they require orally? 15 micrograms of B12. In which tablets do you get 15 micrograms? Neurobion 4, Bicosul, Biplex Fort, Supradine, Cobaltex. All these regular multivitamins have 15 micrograms of B12. Now, this is enough for vegetarians to take. These are cheap tablets, often one rupee per tablet. To give them high doses, vegetarian people, to give them high doses in the form of Neucobal, Tricobal, uh, methicobal, which are often 8, 10 rupees, 15 rupees a tablet, is useless. All this B12 will be coming out of the urine. And sometimes the patient will come to you with reports of B12 more than 2,000, and they will be panicking. Don't give vegetarians high-dose B12 unless you prove pernicious anemia in vegetarians. In non-vegetarians or those with other autoimmune diseases where you suspect pernicious anemia, you should give high dose B12, say 1000 micrograms or 1500 micrograms or at least 750 micrograms per day. Uh, I must have made a few mistakes in the beginning when I spoke about injectable and micrograms. Now I'm talking about oral medicines for malabsorption due to pernicious anemia. If a patient has pernicious anemia, you have to give high dose B12 so that at least 1% will be absorbed. You don't need to give injectables in pernicious anemia now. In the past, we used to learn that injectables are the way to go in pernicious, pernicious anemia. Now it is orals that is the way to go in pernicious anemia. So now, if a patient has pernicious anemia, you will give about 750 to 1500 micrograms per day. How do you know that a patient with anemia 
microcytosis, uh, sorry, macrocytosis and low B12 on serum test has pernicious anemia. How do you know that? There are two ways to know. One is, of course, doing the specific tests called anti-intrinsic factor antibodies and intrinsic anti-parietal cell antibodies. These are two antibodies which may be present in pernicious anemia. The specific test called anti-intrinsic factor antibody is not very sensitive, meaning it will pick up 50% of cases, but not will, will miss 50% of cases. Antiparietal cell antibody will pick up 80% of cases, but it is not very specific, meaning it will be false positive even in the absence of pernicious anemia. So these two tests are available, costly, but you can use them. There is another way to diagnose pernicious anemia, and that is by seeing the response to low dose B12. You have a patient, patient with B12 deficiency, you give small, uh, smaller doses like neurobion or Bicosul, and if the hemoglobin does not rise, then you know that you might be dealing with pernicious anemia. Another way to know is if a patient already has other autoimmune diseases, for example, hypothyroidism, and the patient has come with B12 deficiency. Now, remember, autoimmune diseases can coexist, meaning vitiligo and pernicious anemia can go together in the same patient. Hypothyroidism and pernicious anemia can go together. Type 1 diabetes and pernicious anemia can coexist. If a patient has one more autoimmune disease, think of pernicious anemia as a possibility in this patient, if the patient has B12 deficiency, of course. So there are ways in which you will make out, okay, now I'll need to give a higher dose of oral B12 to counter the intrinsic factor deficiency. Now, if you don't want to give oral, you want to give injectable B12, what injections do you use? Now, we have many injections available, cyanocobalamin, methicobalamin. Methicobalamin is uh, cheap, uh, sorry, costlier than cyanocobalamin. Methicobalamin, like brand names like methico, uh, methicobal inject, injectable, are expensive. Each ampule is 500 micrograms dose, uh, and the cost is around 40 rupees. Whereas the Vitcofol injection, which is cyanocobalamin, is cheaper. The multi-dose ampule of 10 ml is quite cheap. Which one do you use? Both molecules are the same. There is no greater toxicity in cyanocobalamin than methicobalamin. We can use either. So I use the cheaper one. And which, how much dose do you give? In a patient of pernicious anemia, you will have to decide 500 microgram to 1000 microgram of B12 intramuscular per day for five to 10 days and then intramuscular per month, once a, once a month for lifetime if you want to give parenteral uh, B12, which is fine. Now, why, uh, why would you give parenteral? One indication why you would give parenteral is if the patient's hemoglobin is very low. If the patient's hemoglobin is below nine, I would give parenteral first and then follow it up with high dose oral in pernicious anemia. I'll give an example. A patient comes to you with 5 gram hemoglobin. Patient has MCV of 120. Patient's B12 is 100. And now you have to treat. How will you treat this patient? Give intramuscular injections first. At 5 gram hemoglobin, you don't have to transfuse this patient. Patients of B12 deficiency rapidly improve. You don't even have to wait for two weeks to repeat the hemoglobin. They will rapidly improve. It will be like magic. Intramuscular B12 will be like magic. And you give intramuscular and within five doses of once a day dosing, the B12 will be, uh, the hemoglobin will be will have improved by three grams or four grams. Surprisingly fast. So in B12 deficiency, blood transfusion is rarely required. In iron deficiency, blood transfusion may be required when there is ongoing bleeding or the hemoglobin is extremely low. But in B12 deficiency, when will you give blood transfusion? Only when the hemoglobin is, let's say, like 3 or 4 grams and the patient has a hyperdynamic circulatory state, which causes heart failure, pulmonary edema, etc. So, otherwise, in a stable patient who is not very breathless, you please just give intramuscular or if the patient is ready to take intravenous uh, vitamin B12, and correct the uh, megaloblastic anemia. So that is about B12. Uh, now let's go to the other vitamins. The other vitamin that we talk about is vitamin D. Vitamin D, another uh, both 
well used and sometimes abused vitamin which patients require vitamin d supplementation which patients all the whole population of the world probably any any climate any weather requires vitamin d supplementation even farmers working in the fields under the sun require vitamin sorry d3 i am talking about vitamin d3 supplementation infants require vitamin d3 supplementation older people require vitamin d3 every one of us should be taking vitamin d3 supplements and not rely only on sunlight or diet because there are plant based diets also which contain d3 egg egg yolk contains d3 but we must take some supplementation all our lives so children are given about 400 units per day from their very early age and because breast milk does not contain vitamin d and the older people the dose is not certain but it can be anything from 400 iu per day to 4000 iu per day is the range of recommendations given by various um, recommending authorities so everybody has to be on vitamin d3 without exception now uh, if you find d3 deficiency on blood test what uh, what is the change in the daily supplementation when, Anyway, you are taking say thousand units or two thousand units per day, but if, suppose you are deficient, what supplementation now should you increase? Now, what is deficiency? Uh, we all know that the level below thirty is considered deficient. Now, the science here is also not not very clear. One thing is clear: any level below twelve is deficient. Any level above thirty is sufficient. Between twelve and thirty is the gray zone. We don't know. so about 30 if you find somebody's level then ask them to continue their daily vitamin d as usual my usual daily vitamin d is about 2000 iu i give 2000 iu per day to almost everybody who is an adult now uh, if the patient has deficiency below 12 for example how do you load the patient do you give a loading dose and then continue the maintenance therapy yes please give a loading dose of vitamin d to this patient what loading dose do you give some people give 60000 vitamin d some people give 6 lakh units of vitamin d 60000 is available in the oral form we know that the forms are available are granules uh, nano particle uh, liquids and regular capsules or tablets of 60000 you can give any of these or you can give an arachidol injection of 6 lakh units to an adult what do i do now again from doctor to doctor from physician to physician your recommendations are going to vary so what do i do based on whatever science i can collect on this because there is no no absolute recommendation of the dosing of vitamin d in deficient patients what i do is i give one injection aristol to any patient who comes with to me with deficiency and no more than one injection even if the level is 10 i will stick to one injection and start calcium with vitamin d tablets every day so for example i will start tablet tio which has 500 mg calcium 1000 uh, iu of vitamin d or shellcal hd which has 500 calcium and 500 vitamin d i'll start any one of the regular preparations available to us and continue that for life and i will give one injection of aracetol 6 lakh units intramuscular every year every year this patient will get my patient will get it. suppose the patient does not like injections or is not likely to follow up for um, every year injections then i will give them 60000 per month of vitamin d over and above the maintenance dose that means that will make it 1000 uh, daily units and 60000 sorry 500 mg i use 500 iu daily in shellcal hd for example and 60000 per month so that will make it about a uh, 2500 odd per day of uh, supplementation now uh, if the patient is deficient and i want to give oral 60k is there a loading mechanism you all have given 60k per week for 8 weeks and then once a month for life everybody does that my thinking is if you can give 6 lakh units at one go why can't you give 60000 units every day for 8 to 10 days you can give giving weekly doses makes the compliance more difficult than giving daily doses so 60k every day with a good meal or nanoparticles which are supposed to be better absorbed even if the meal is not fatty you give every day for 8 to 10 days and then continue 
oral 60k once a month in a deficient patient so this is how, this is my style i'll repeat it if you like uh, when we do the q and a when one thing that i often tell tell my patients is that you have, your car does not run only on tires it has to have a driver once you give vitamin d to a patient you have just given drivers sorry you have just given tires the driver is calcium without calcium just giving vitamin d the bones will not get the calcium that they want from vitamin d the what is the job of vitamin d to absorb vitamin d uh, sorry calcium from the gut and take it to the bones that is the job of vitamin d you give vitamin d in a deficient patient but you are not given oral calcium the patient will not benefit from the vitamin d so what do you give orally calcium wise when you have a patient with vitamin d deficiency first thing is in young people we don't like to give calcium supplements in the form of tablets so in the young patient i will always advise a rich calcium rich diet so that they can they can take more milk products more uh, millets like nachni uh, till uh, that is sesame uh, nuts and seeds and uh, drumsticks or um, uh, lady finger whatever calcium foods that you know are rich uh, they should double their daily intake of that calcium rich food that is my simple uh, uh, formula for them double the calcium rich foods every day if the patient is older then i supplement so older when i define older as people who are either nearing menopause in amongst ladies or those above 15 gents i ask them to take a calcium supplement of 500 mg per day so that the daily calcium intake uh, crosses 1200 mg if possible now uh, what is the problem with giving oral tablet calcium there are two problems chiefly one is constipation in the elderly constipation is a major uh, bane people don't like constipation and of course uh, it should not happen so calcium tablets sometimes can cause significant constipation in fact any geriatric patient who comes to you with constipation as a complaint please check the medicines that they are receiving and calcium may be the number one cause for constipation now because of constipation what we have to sometimes do is stop the calcium or decrease the dose what how do you know how, how do you decrease the dose 500 mg calcium can be turned to 250 mg capsule tablet of calcium by either breaking the tablet and taking half or changing to calcium citrate that calcium citrate salts have 250 mg of elemental calcium typically there is 150 mg elemental calcium tablet also available uh, for example triple a cal is a brand name with 150 mg element so you try to decrease the dose of daily calcium by by uh, uh, changing the brand or breaking the tablet and taking less of course there are syrups of calcium available which has which have sometimes 100 mg of calcium per 5 ml you can use those syrups also uh, another thing that you may have to do is just stop the calcium and increase the dietary intake of calcium the second problem with giving calcium is stones if a patient has kidney stones as a previous history or has sonographically uh, seen kidney stones without any symptoms also giving tablets of calcium worsens uh, their nephrolithiasis they can get more new stones occurring these patients again there is a relative contraindication to giving calcium treatment and i have regretted giving calcium to patients with stones because they do come with symptomatic severe renal colic sometimes so what do you do in a patient with osteoporotic 60 year old male who has already kidney stones what do you do you are in a quandary here i would say give low dose of calcium and just just push the dietary calcium intake remember increased dietary calcium reduces the chances of kidney stones which is paradoxical calcium tablets increase the chances of kidney stones oral dietary calcium like in milk products decreases the chances of kidney stones so just push more oral calcium in patients with uh, with uh, history of kidney stones so that is about uh, calcium intake uh, vitamin d i think i have covered the injectable portion one small practical pointer which uh, which all gps would already know is that aristol injection is an oil based injection and we have to give it intramuscular in the buttock and to give it deep intramuscular which is the correct thing to give it deep intramuscular 
please use a one and a half inch needle instead of the regular one inch needle whenever you give an injection of Aristo. Uh, that may be a good idea to prevent uh, local collection, local inflammation. So that is about vitamin D. We have done vitamin D, we have done calcium, we have done iron, we have done B12. Now let us go to the smaller vitamins, so to speak. B1. B1 is thiamine. Thiamine is an interesting vitamin. It is an important vitamin. Uh, so a few pointers about thiamine. One is in alcoholics, thiamine deficiency occurs significantly. And uh, therefore, they also get a disease called beriberi, if you know, dry beriberi uh, with peripheral neuropathy or wet beriberi with dilated cardiomyopathy are two common problems with thiamine deficiency. Not common, but two co problems with thiamine deficiency, especially in the alcoholics. Now, in, in an alcoholic, whoever or anybody who drinks regularly, uh, please tell them to take thiamine supplementation even before they develop any problem with related to thiamine deficiency. Sorry, prevent thiamine must be given to all alcohol consumers. What do you give? You give tablet Benalgis, 100 milligram once a day. One brand name is Benalgis, for example. Uh, it's a, it contains, I think, benfotiamine, which is a derivative of uh, thiamine. So any thiamine tablet, uh, you can give once a day to a patient who's taking alcohol. I, I try to convince my patient by saying that you are taking leaf 52. Uh, we have a better molecule now, better than leaf 52 for preventing uh, problems in alcoholism. So that is one thing that you can do. Now, the bigger role of thiamine, especially for the family physician in an emergency situation is if a patient comes with hypoglycemia to your clinic and the patient uh, has to be given parental sugar, dextrose, please remember to give thiamine injectable along with that dextrose, meaning you give uh, injectable optineuron, for example, contains 100 milligram thiamine. Injection of neuron on every hypoglycemic patient must relieve, must receive immediately as as uh, concomitantly with the IV dextrose. The reason is when you give IV dextrose to any patient, if they have thiamine deficiency to begin with, like if they are alcohol consumers or they are they are having uh, malabsorption syndromes, then these patients will go into Wernicke's encephalopathy. If due to the thiamine de uh, deficiency, you give dextrose, the, the brain metabolism uses up all the uh, glucose or dextrose uh, and all the, uses up all the thiamine available in the body and acute thiamine deficiency causes uh, this syndrome of altered sensorium with uh, uh, of thermoplegia with ataxia, which is called uh, uh, Wernicke's encephalopathy. Now, you must prevent it by giving. So if a patient of hypoglycemia comes to your clinic, the first thing that you do, if you're going to admit the patient to the hospital, the first thing that you do is give intramuscular optineuron in your clinic, one uh, optineuron, one ampule, in which contains 100 milligrams of thiamine in your clinic, IM, if IV line is available, IV is also fine. And send the patient to the hospital uh, uh, immediately for severe hypoglycemia. So that is one thing that you can do with injectable. Another role of B1 that I like is in dilated cardiomyopathy. Now, this is not something which is not uh, a textbook thing, but this is something that I, I think is logical. Dilated cardiomyopathy basically means that there is global hypokinesia. The commonest cause of dilated cardiomyopathy may be viral or viral myocarditis, post-viral myocarditis or dilated cardiomyopathy. Alcoholism is an important cause of dilated cardiomyopathy. And beri beri, that is thiamine deficiency, is an important cause of dilated cardiomyopathy. And thiamine deficiency occurs in alcoholism. So any, now there is no way to prove that this dilated cardiomyopathy is due to alcohol, due to viral, or due to thiamine deficiency. But any dilated cardiomyopathy that comes to me, meaning ejection fraction low, with no regional wall motion abnormality, global hypokinesia. Any such patient who comes to me, even whether or not an alcoholic, I give oral thiamine tablet to this patient. 
just in case the dilated cardiomyopathy is due to thiamine deficiency, it is a correctable problem. We can treat beriberi. So wet beriberi, wet beriberi is called wet beriberi because there is congestive heart failure due to dilated cardiomyopathy, is considered a reversible form of dilated cardiomyopathy. And hence, every such patient, I will give thiamine 100 milligrams or more per day uh, in the hope that this is thiamine deficiency related dilated cardiomyopathy. So this is about uh, <coughs> B1. Uh, one more vitamin that is important is B5. B5 is pantothenic acid. Uh, one, there, there are many problems with pantothenic acid uh, metabolism in pediatrics, and I don't know uh, the, that area. In adult medicine, one important area of pantothenic acid is something called the burning feet syndrome. Some patients will come to you who are non-diabetic. Remember, non-diabetic patient, if they come to you with burning in the soles of feet, both soles, bilateral, uh, severe burning since months. They have taken many, many vitamins and many injections and they are not getting better. Remember, pantothenic acid deficiency, B5 deficiency, is a specific cause of burning feet syndrome. And you have to give 500 milligrams of pantothenic acid twice a day for an indefinite period of time to get them better. And the response is dramatic. So the patient will thank you because they have not felt better in their burning feet uh, since ages. Burning feet syndrome can occur in other diseases also. Like, for example, it can occur in diabetic peripheral neuropathy. But here, what I'm talking about, the burning feet syndrome of pantothenic acid deficiency is where only the soles burn, not even the dorsum of the feet. Only the soul burns and the patient has no diabetic, no alcoholism, no other B12 deficiency, etc. No other cause of peripheral neuropathy. 500 mg pantothenic acid is not easily available at the pharmacies and you will have to order them from places like Flipkart or Amazon uh, or other websites. So that is your pantothenic acid. Then there is B6. B6 is pyridoxin. <clears throat> pyridoxin, we all know the common use of pyridoxin. The most common use for probably in our medicine is uh, uh, with INH to prevent peripheral neuropathy due to INH. We give pyridoxin 20 mg per day. Uh, one unfortunate thing is that 20 milligram is not available as 20 milligram. Usually we end up giving 40 milligram per day, which is okay. Uh, but never use 100 milligram per day for INH patients. And, uh, B long, for example, is a brand of 100 milligram per day. 100 milligram is an excessive dose of B, uh, B6. And this excessive dose actually can cause uh, peripheral neuropathy by itself. Paradoxically, high dose pyridoxine taken for a long term, side effect is peripheral neuropathy. So the try not to use very high doses for a long term. But 20 to 40 milligram per day is fine. Uh, there are other uses of pyridoxine. Uh, some of you will know them better than me. For example, uh, in pregnancy, uh, we use pyridoxine uh, for the morning sickness. Uh, then it is also used by some people or probably approved uh, as a treatment for PMS. Uh, premenstrual syndrome. So there are other uses of pyridoxine which uh, uh, which are outside the purview of internal medicine. So this is pyridoxine, B6. Then there is another uh, vitamin called B7. B7 is uh, biotin. Biotin, as you know all, is uh, used for hair fall. Uh, now one thing that is uh, 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 scientific is that there is no evidence that biotin helps hair fall. There is no real evidence that biotin helps brittle nails. But nail and hair disease, biotin has been frequently used. And many people claim that it works, which is fine. So you can use biotin. Biotin is available in 5 milligram or in 10 milligram tablet form. And of course, it is available in, as a, a concoction for hair fall. Many dermatologists use biotin in combination with other medicines. Uh, yeah, so that is biotin for you. Then there is, of course, uh, 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 folic acid. Folic acid, I think, also is known as B9. Folic acid is, uh, uh, we, have, we have a good source of folic acid in the, in the form of vegetarian foods, vegetables, etc. So folic acid is not a very uh, a scarce, uh, scarce vitamin. Uh, at the same time, folic acid has been used uh, principally in uh, pregnancy or pre-pregnancy state. Uh, remember this, that 400 micrograms of folic acid per day 
400 micrograms uh, per day, that is less than one milligram per day, is enough uh, to give in patients who are desirous of pregnancy to prevent neural tube uh, defects. Uh, but we end up giving five milligrams, that is 5,000 micrograms per day uh, as a routine, which is not necessary. Uh, another area where we can use smaller doses of folic acid is in patients taking methotrexate. If you, uh, if you remember, methotrexate is an antifolate drug often used in disease modification in rheumatoid arthritis or many other uh, sorry, autoimmune diseases. We use methotrexate once a week. Uh, and methotrexate, the principal side effect is uh, mucosal ulcers. So to prevent those mucositis uh, complications, we give folic acid. Now, important thing to remember, of course, everybody knows this, is to if you give folic acid on the same day as methotrexate, the methotrexate efficacy is lost because it actually acts by uh, inhibiting folic acid. So any patient receiving methotrexate should not receive folic acid around that time. And second fact to remember is that less than two milligrams of folic acid is enough per week to counter the mucositis caused by methotrexate. So all, so we we give a lot of, uh, we give folic acid five days a week and then methotrexate for Saturday or Sunday. Instead of that, what I do is if methotrexate is being taken on Sunday or Saturday and Sunday, all folic acid that you need is just two tablets maybe taken on Tuesday and Wednesday so that there is separation by significant number of days from the uh, methotrexate. So that's all that you need to give in terms of folic acid. Folic acid, of course, is also used uh, uh, as empiric therapy for uh, general after ulcerations, etc. The efficacy is poor in after ulcerations to give folic acid where there is no antifolate drug going on, antifolate drug like cotrimoxazole, for example, or uh, methotrexate. If there's no antifolate drug going on, uh, it's probably not going to act. So that is about folic acid. Uh, I don't know if I've left behind any, any major vitamin. Vitamin C. Yeah, vitamin C. So uh, vitamin C is, a, of course, a water-soluble vitamin which has been misused or overused or abused uh, plentifully. It is probably the most overused, unnecessarily overused vitamin that we have in the whole world. And that overuse began when one Nobel Prize winner declared that common cold can be treated with vitamin C. Uh, and he would, Paul, Paul uh, what was his name? Paul, I forgot his name. Uh, he started taking 15 grams of vitamin C per day uh, to combat cold or to improve, uh, uh, improve the immunity, so to speak. It is all nonsense. Vitamin C does not improve immunity to any great extent. Vitamin C is principally indicated in scurvy and in iron deficiency anemia. There are two indications of vitamin C. Vitamin C in, uh, there are pediatric indications are, which are very different and I'm not going there. But in, in scurvy, which we don't see anymore, uh, we give vitamin C to treat the, treat the diseases, including the skin lesions, etc. But more importantly for us, vitamin C has one role where we don't use it when we should. We use it for common cold and things like that. We should use it for iron deficiency anemia with iron. Iron absorption is significantly improved by vitamin C, which is why sometimes doctors will tell patients, okay, you have your iron tablet and you have orange juice. But remember, food and iron basically have a problem because iron is absorbed less in the presence of a meal. So if you give only orange juice, it's fine. But if you give orange juice, meal and iron, it's not fine. So you, what I simply do is give vitamin C 500 milligram with the 25 milligram of iron that I give. It is very it's much much cheaper to give uh, uh, vitamin C than to give orange juice one glass, which might be costlier than the vitamin C tablet. So just give vitamin C in iron deficient anemia throughout the course of iron. Of course, if you're giving parental iron, you don't need vitamin C. Only with oral iron therapy will you give vitamin C. So vitamin C, uh, of course, has been again abused in COVID times. Uh, but as I said, in viral infections, I don't think vitamin C has any scientific evidence to support. Yeah. Uh, anything else? Uh, I can take question and answers now. I don't know. Vitamin whether... E. Sir, vitamin E. Linus Pauling. The scientist who won the Nobel Prize for vitamin C was Linus Pauling. I just remembered his name. But that's okay. Vitamin E. Yeah, very important vitamin. I'm sorry. I missed that. 
Vitamin E again abused. After vitamin C, maybe more than vitamin C, vitamin E is overused, abused, given too much credit for many things which are useless. Uh, vitamin E has been used for hair fall, for skin problems, for um, 100 things. Now, the use in vitamin, of vitamin E in fatty liver is the area of controversy. In fatty liver, if a sonologist says there is fatty liver, you will start vitamin E. Please don't start vitamin E. Vitamin E is not for fatty liver. It is for NASH, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. There has to be elevation of SGOT and SGPT with the fatty liver seen on sonography. For you to say that this might be, might be non-alcoholic steatohepatitis and therefore vitamin E will help. Vitamin E helps in this very specific situation. Fatty liver on ultrasound with elevated enzymes, at least three times the upper limit of normal. In a patient who is non-diabetic and non-alcoholic, this is the situation where you may give vitamin E. Even here, the evidence is not great, not robust, but you should give probably vitamin E in this patient. I'll repeat, patient has fatty liver on sonography, patient has high enzymes, three times the upper limit of normal. Some people say two times, but three times upper limit of normal. For example, 120 SGOT, 120 SGPT. And patient is not an alcoholic, you can't give vitamin E in alcoholics, and not a diabetic because you can't give vitamin D in, vitamin E in diabetics. Why don't we give in diabetics? We don't give in diabetics because vitamin E increases the chance of intracranial hemorrhage in diabetics. So which is why we should avoid vitamin E in diabetics. If you want to give, give it for a few weeks or months for some other indication, but not for NASH. For NASH, control diabetes, do lifestyle management. Generally also in NASH, what is required is lifestyle management, not vitamin E. Vitamin E becomes a crutch, becomes a, uh, something that we hang upon while not giving stress or importance to lifestyle management. So vitamin E is probably, and for skin people use it as an antioxidant and I don't know. I can't see evidence of vitamin E utility in so many diseases that uh, it is used. So vitamin E is not a <coughs> is abused. Yeah. Uh, any other thing that I have forgot? The zinc, chromium, and selenium. Okay. Uh, the the minerals that uh, you talk about, which are also sometimes called trace elements, uh, these I'm not very comfortable with uh, in terms of evidence. So chromium was pandied about or talked about a lot in diabetes management. And uh, there were studies which showed that chromium is useful in diabetes. It has not come into mainstream internal medicine. I don't have any, uh, any recommendations from societies like American Diabetes Society or European Diabetes Association where they have said chromium has to be given as an important drug. I don't know. Giving chromium may not be harmful. But uh, I don't know. Zinc, I think, I mean, I may be wrong, but I think the one proven good use of zinc is in diarrhea, especially in pediatrics. And there, the zinc, even for 10 days or more, uh, reduces the, uh, improves the diarrhea, especially viral diarrheas. I'm not sure about, I mean, my knowledge is limited in diarrhea and zinc in pediatrics, but uh, that is one area where it is used. Uh, I can't remember any other area of zinc where zinc is extremely useful, but maybe I'll think of something if I get. Selenium, again, um, those who are, you know, you know, nutritionists talk a lot about these micronutrients. And uh, uh, I think it becomes fashionable and a fad to talk about them, to give them. I know people who take 50 supplements in one day, 50 molecules in one day, uh, uh, thinking that they will prolong their life. But I'm not sure whether this, this is useful. Anything else? That magnesium. 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 Hypomagnesemia is a, not a common problem in India. It is a common problem in some continents like Africa. So I'm not sure whether magnesium is a big problem here. Uh, magnesium as a, as a drug is useful. Magnesium sulfate, for example, in eclampsia of pregnancy is useful. Uh, uh, in resistant, probably seizures, it is useful. But magnesium as a daily supplement, uh, I don't see any utility of magnesium. Again, I may be wrong. You may you may show me studies which magnesium show. But in mainstream medicine, evidence-based mainstream medicine, I still don't see magnesium as a strong recommendation uh, coming regularly. 
we give it, I give it, I use magnesium. I use ultra magnesium tablet or MGD3 tablets as placebos because patients talk about it, patients know about it. Placebos are better, uh, placebos work better as placebos when there is some uh, rudimentary knowledge in the public to whom you are giving. If they know a little bit about the molecule, the placebo effect increases tremendously. And therefore, to give such molecules is a good thing. For example, if a vitamin, I'm giving a vitamin, I'll give cobaltic C, Z, S, and stress on the fact that C is chromium, S is selenium, Z is zinc, and the patient will be very happy that the patient is receiving so many uh, good uh, minerals also. But I know that it is it is just uh, something that we are giving as placebos. Most vitamins in most situations are placebos. But at the same time, I would say every day B12 in vegetarians and every day vitamin D in everybody is mandatory. You must you must not miss them. Uh, we have questions on the audience. Thank you very much, sir, for an excellent talk. Very insightful and informative. Uh, Dr. Sanjay? Yes, Dr. Sanjay, can't hear you. Unmute, unmute yourself, Dr. Sanjay. Vitamin A. Yeah, vitamin A, pediatric use chiefly. Vitamin A, as you know, pediatric uh, uh, pro ophthalmic problems with vitamin A deficiency are well known. Uh, but in adult, Vitamin A as a regular thing, I don't think it is uh, of any use. Uh, two or three points that I can make here is that uh, do take care uh, when you're giving patient treatment for acne and you're giving doxycycline or you're giving isotretinoin. Just make sure that the patient is not receiving vitamin A because if the patient is receiving vitamin A and you give isotretinoin or doxycycline, then the patient has a greater chance of what is known as idiopathic uh, intracranial hypertension or benign intracranial hypertension. That is a disaster. Uh, otherwise, vitamin A, uh, yeah, supradine, for example, I don't know now what they, they have changed the formulation, but tablet supradine uh, used to contain 10,000 IU of vitamin A. 10,000 IU of vitamin A. Now, that is ridiculous. You can't give supradine without knowing the content of vitamin A within it. So be careful about giving excessive doses of vitamin A. Yeah. Dr. Sanjay, L-carnitine and lecithin quite often used. Yeah, L-carnitine uh, is, of course, uh, used for muscles typically, uh, used by orthopedics uh, and sometimes used with Evion, you know, Evion LC, where L-carnitine is a component of that model. I don't know any evidence. Just like there is no evidence for glucosamine or uh, chondroitin sulfate, no evidence. Similarly, I don't think there is enough evidence for carnitine, both in skeletal muscle or in cardiac muscle. I, I don't know. But so, as, I, as you know, these are costly placebos, I think. And uh, if you look for evidence-based uh, utility of these molecules, I don't think you'll find much. I'm open to correction, uh, but I don't, I have tried looking up them up and I don't find it. Uh, another thing? Uh, Dr. Sand, there are many questions on the chat box. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, Priti, madam, I can't see the questions in okay. the mention in the YouTube, so you can okay. take the questions yeah. first. Yeah, just a minute. Yeah, so hypervitaminosis of the fat soluble vitamins. I think you covered part of it, which should be avoided. Um, so ADEK, as you know, ADEK, uh, the fat soluble and vitamin D hypervitaminosis causes two major problems. So if a patient comes to you with a vitamin D blood level of say 150, we know that above 75 is high. Above 75, if the patient comes to you with a vitamin D level, your immediate action is to do a serum calcium. How does vitamin D harm? It harms by causing hypercalcemia. So as soon as vitamin D level is high, detected, look for serum calcium. If serum calcium is high, say more than 10.5 or 11, then you probably will need to hospitalize this patient and treat the hypercalcemia with intravenous fluids or drugs. Take a second. Deva Shimlik in your lecture channel. So that is vitamin a, A, vitamin vitamin D. Vitamin K, hypervitaminosis we rarely get because we don't give so much vitamin K. 
similarly vitamin e parenteral is not given vitamin a hypervitaminosis causes uh, intracranial hypertension so yeah so any difference which is better cyanocobalamin or methylcobalamin cyanocobalamin is better not okay. better because it is more effective better because it is cheaper okay uh, general we use 60000 units of vitamin d per week is it okay i mean i think you have covered that in your uh, answers mgd3 also you have covered so is fol folic acid contraindicated in can cancer patient as it helps in cell maturation no, I don't think it is contraindicated. Many people say sugar is contraindicated in cancer because sugar feeds the cancer cells and cancer cells multiply more because of sugar. I don't, these are all things that come into the media and I don't think it is correct. So I don't think folic acid is harmful uh, and causes spread of cancer. So vitamin so E in leg cramps, even I had this question. Somebody has asked on the chat. First of all, let me clarify what is a placebo effect. A placebo effect is an effect which is a real effect. Many patients get better, right? What is the placebo effect of medicines within painful conditions? Within painful conditions, the placebo effect is up, up to the tune of 30% or maybe 40%. Meaning if you give the patient a sham pill, not vitamin E, a sham pill made of only glucose, then the patient has a 30% chance that cramps will get better, leg cramps will get better. Similarly, vitamin E, as studied against placebo, vitamin E is not better. So vitamin E has a good effect as a placebo. 30% relief. Now 30% is a good relief. The patient will tell me, okay, I'm getting relief with vitamin E. Fine, please take vitamin E. But that doesn't mean I use it as an evidence-based medicine. But giving it as a placebo is fine. Sir, to prevent cardiovascular uh, disease, Antioxidants are also prescribed containing mainly uh, omega-3 fatty acid. What is your opinion? So omega-3 fatty acids evidence-based role is only in hypertriglyceridemia. Hypertriglyceridemia, 2 to 4 grams of omega-3 fatty acids per day can reduce triglycerides and therefore reduce cardiovascular morbidity. That is the only role. Uh, antioxidants per se as uh, as a treatment for prevention of cardiovascular disease, I think it is against a hype created by lay, lay people, newspapers, media, nutritionists. And I don't think, I think it's a waste of money. Uh, since you are on cardiovascular disease, there is a small evidence that excessive calcium supplementation in patients of chronic kidney disease may worsen calcific uh, atherosclerosis. Now, this is something that is uh, still not very clear uh, to us. But that some studies have shown that if you give vitamin K2 along with the calcium, then you may prevent this calcification of the arteries of the coronary circulation. But again, these, these are areas which I still I still have to study more and maybe there is more study required. So should patients on metformin and PPI take more dose of B12? Excellent question. Thank you so much for asking. I had forgotten. All patients of metformin or PPI must take 15 to 30 micrograms of B12 per day. When I say 15 micrograms, I mean any tablet like Neurobion, Bplex, Ford, etc. And you can give two such tablets per day uh, to patients of, uh, even if the patient is non-vegetarian and probably is taking B12 anyway in the food, you please supplement all metformin patients with B12. If you are giving PPIs for short durations, like four weeks or so, you need not give B12 to these patients. But if PPIs, say for severe heart as hernia, which are on prolonged PPIs, you must give 15 to 30 micrograms per day. Sir, all of melatonin as an antioxidant. Oh, I didn't know melatonin was an antioxidant, so probably not. But melatonin, I think, is just a sleeping aid approved in jet lag and uh, used by many as a sleeping aid. Again, I think part placebo more than anything else. So one interesting question. If a patient has had one episode of kidney stone or calculi, uh, should he avoid calcium supplements totally? So I do believe that if the stone was calcium oxalate stone, meaning suppose if the uric acid stone doesn't matter because uric acid stones do not recur with calcium supplementation. But if we do somehow know that this is calcium oxalate stone, 
then the chances that they will have it again are very high, significantly high. So I would, even one episode of calcium stone, I would, uh, symptomatic, I would definitely try to see that I would avoid. Uh, but yeah, this is an area of controversy. And I know many people who do not believe in not giving calcium. I would say if we can push dietary calcium, we should push dietary calcium. Sir, in mouth ulcers, sir, in mouth ulcers, we are giving different vitamins and uh, other things. So there are different causes of mouth ulcers. So what do you recommend in mouth ulcers? Uh, so one thing that I will tell you is that the failure of giving vitamins to treat mouth ulcers is very high. Meaning you will almost never be satisfied by giving folic acid or probiotics or B12 in mouth ulcers, which are recurrent. Uh, isolated mouth ulcer or after ulcer incidents, say due to very spicy meals or some injury to, from teeth, these will recover on their own and you don't need to do much. But if there are mouth ulcers, which have, many patients have recurrent mouth ulcers, these will not respond to folic acid, etc. You must find the cause. Mouth ulcers can be due to causes as varied as dental problems, gum disease, uh, uh, Bechet syndrome, which is a rheumatological disorder, or uh, deficiencies, so many causes of mouth ulcers. So I don't think you will uh, you will be empirically treating mouth ulcers. You will find the how cause. common herpes infection causing mouth ulcers. Herpes so, herpes simplex. You mean herpes simplex as a cause is not common, but uh, herpes does cause can mouth happen. ulcers. Herpes, herpes, labialis. Herpes. herpes labialis and even intraoral herpes simplex can happen. Yes. Yes. So does calcium need magnesium for utilization? Does calcium need magnesium for its absorption? I will have to read up physiology. I don't know. It may be so. Somebody is asking that question means that yes, person sir. knows better than me. So <laughs> that person is asking for a reason. Uh, so maybe they can clarify, but I don't know. Okay, so calcium citrate is better or calcium carbonate? Good question and I have not uh, addressed that. Calcium citrate and carbonate have two, dif two major differences. Calcium citrate is absorbed irrespective of meals. Calcium carbonate is absorbed better after meals. So if the patient can take after meals, calcium carbonate is a molecule which will get absorbed. Citrate will get absorbed irrespective of whether taken empty stomach or not. Calcium citrate, the second difference is calcium citrate does not require acid medium for absorption. Meaning if the patient is achlorhydria due to PPS, calcium citrate will still be absorbed. Whereas in, in the presence of PPIs, calcium carbonate absorption will suffer. These are the two main problems. Now the third thing is calcium citrate preparations contain 250 milligrams of elemental calcium, not more. Calcium carbonate preparations often contain 500 milligrams of elemental calcium. So when you're giving calcium citrate, some people start thinking, okay, 250 milligram is same as 500 milligram. In meaning carbonate 500 can be replaced by citrate. I don't think so. Cit elemental is element. Even if it is absorbed better on empty stomach, it only 250 milligrams available for the body. If you're giving citrate, you would remember that you're giving an underdose of calcium. So if you are giving citrate, I would prefer to give it twice a day. The only other reason of giving citrate also would be if you want to reduce the dose of calcium in a patient. 250 milligrams is uh, better tolerated constipation-wise than 500 milligrams of calcium carbonate. That you can do. But to think that citrate will cause less kidney stones is also wrong. Citrate 250 milligrams is equal to 500 milligrams of carbonate is also wrong. So yeah. And of course, citrate is more expensive that you know. So, role of sublingual B12 and vitamin D? I have not heard of vitamin Even D. I have sublingual. not heard. But vitamin Even B12, I'm... of course, there are strips available. Sublingual strips are available. Nasal sprays are available of B12. Uh, most strips or sprays contain, I think, 250 micrograms of uh, B12, which is a significant dose. Uh, if the patient cannot take orally for some reason or malabsorption is there, uh, then yeah, you can use these uh, locally absorbed mechanisms. Uh, you can, but they're expensive, but not routinely. Only those patients who cannot take orally. Having said that, one, one must remember that B12 deficiency, if it is very severe, can cause significant nausea. Now, this is one symptom which is unusual, but not unknown. Uh, so if a patient has significant nausea and you want to minimize the use of orals, 
and want to not give intramuscular injections of B12, these patients a nasal spray uh, uh, would be a good good option. So there are some more questions, but uh, some of them you have answered. One important question: role of omega three fatty acids in arthritis. It's a hype, I think. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, in arthritis, osteoarthritis, I suppose they mean osteoarthritis. osteoarthritis. So many things are done because nothing works. So uh, when there is no treatment, there are many treatments. That is the uh, dictum in medicine. So I don't think osteoarthritis, uh, I, there are people who give PRP, uh, that is platelet-rich plasma, and there are people who give intra-articular steroids. Again, not a great idea. So I don't think that... Um, Omega-3 should be working. But again, this is something which may, may have happened new and I don't know about. So how to prescribe vitamin D and calcium in elderly patients and postmenopausal women? I'll revise that. So this is what I do. I'll just give you my example. And there are many regimens and many people do very different things. All of them may be correct. So my idea is to give at least 2,000 units of vitamin D per day in the elderly, in the older person. 2,000 units, how do I give? I give 60K per month. That becomes 2,000 per day. And additionally, I give calcium with vitamin D. So my brand, for example, the brand I use is Shellcal HD. I will use 500 milligram of Shellcal HD. My 500 milligram is calcium. 500 IU is vitamin D. So essentially, the patient will get 2,500 IU of vitamin D and 500 milligrams of supplemental calcium per day. This is how I give it in the elderly. If there is deficiency in the form of vitamin D low, I will give loading doses. If there is osteopenia or osteoporosis on DEXA scan, uh, I may push the calcium dose to 1000 milligram per day uh, or just push the dietary intake up. If the patient has to tolerate 1000 milligrams in, in terms of constipation. But if tolerable, then I would push the dose up in a patient who is really osteopenic or osteoporotic. Otherwise, this find it, I would stick to 500 milligrams of elemental calcium per day. Thank you very much, sir, for yeah. taking so much time and answering all the questions on chat box. It was a really informative, insightful, and a gripping session. Yes. Everyone is glued to their chairs, I'm sure. Uh, thank you, Dr. Vibhakar, Dr. Sanjay, and yes. uh, Rahul, Enlace Technology team. And uh, we are sorry that Dr. Pragnesh Vacharajani and Dr. Shah couldn't join us. I thank all the audience. Without you, it will not be possible. Thank you for the so much of interaction. And it was a hot topic. And we were waiting for this. Thank you very much.